This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 35. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everyone, it's Matt Sicoria here, and this is session 35 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you're new to the show, this is the uh, podcast where we talk about uh, current issues in today's field uh, with some of the sharpest minds in the field. So and today is no exception. I am joined by Kim and Tim Heald of Constellations Behavioral Services, located right here in my adopted home state of New Hampshire. And we talk about all the things you need to know, or at least many of the things you need to know when you are contemplating starting your own clinic. And so we can get into the nitty gritty of that once the conversation begins. But uh, long story short, they share a lot of their wisdom, a lot of the lessons they learned so that uh, maybe you don't have to learn them the hard way. So I think it's a fun conversation. I know starting clinics is a you know, kind of a big topic. If you look on the ABA Business Builders Facebook page, there's all sorts of questions about that. Um, so if this is a topic you want to hear more about, reach out to me, uh, and you can do that on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations, or you can certainly email me, matt at behavioral observations.com, uh, or get a hold of me in, uh, on the other social media platforms that are out there. Uh, and let me know. I've got, uh, you know, certainly these guys can come back and, and do another round. And I've got uh, many other friends and colleagues who are also starting their own clinics or have been running them for a while. Uh, so, again, give me some feedback. Let me know what you think about this. I think it's an interesting development in our field. So, um, before we get to the interview itself, I've got a couple of quick housekeeping things to go over. Uh, first one is that uh, we are coming really close to the uh, third annual New Hampshire Association for Behavior Analysis Conference. And uh, if you recall back a few episodes, I went over and did many interviews with all the speakers and things like that. And I want to give you guys some uh, some uh, shout outs here. We managed to sell out the conference. Not only did we sell out the conference, we sold out the overflow that we opened up after. So it, uh, it, it certainly speaks to the, the need for people to find quality continuing education. And so we aim to provide that uh, at this conference. So if you are registered, I hope to see you there. Um, I won't be speaking this year. I'll be doing something. Uh, I'll be doing some other glamorous work. And depending on what area of the alphabet your name falls in, I might be handing out your uh, registration uh, uh, materials. <laughs> I might be running around with a clipboard, sign, making sure you don't, you know, run off and and inadvertently uh, get CEs without being in the uh, in the. Uh, conference area and other sorts of uh, fun tasks like that. So I hope to see many listeners there, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I also want to thank all of those of, uh, all those of you who um, wrote in with such nice words about the last interview we did with uh, Megan Miller. Uh, that was round two for, for Megan, and she just did a really nice job talking about earning instructional control. And the interest in that was uh, so great, and the amount of questions that we didn't get to was was so much that she's going to join me on one of my membership Zoom hangouts. So if you want to learn more about that, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash membership, and you can sign up and figure out what the deal is. Uh, with that. And so basically the Cliff Notes version is, is that that is an opportunity for uh, you guys to come on a Zoom hangout and ask questions to Megan directly. And we'll be doing that on uh, September 27th. Um, so that uh, is something I'm definitely looking forward to. And uh, let's see, one other thing before we get to our interview, um, this episode is certainly sponsored by Britain Behavioral Consulting. Uh, you want to go to BrittonBehavioralConsulting.com, that's B-R-I-T-T-O-N, and uh, Lisa Britton provides quality, independent fieldwork supervision for all of those listeners out there who are uh, uh, aspiring BCBAs. You know, sometimes it's really hard to find quality supervision, and she um, is kind of owning that space in terms of providing that at a distance, uh, in a distance format. So if you want to learn more about how that all works, you can head on over to session 29 of the Behavioral Observations podcast, where I 
uh, interview her, and she talks about some of the uh, best practices for supervision. But uh, uh, the best way to figure out if this is a fit for you is to go to BrittonBehavioralConsulting.com forward slash contact, reach out to Lisa, and uh, again, see if this is something that would work for your needs. And I think that's pretty much it. So without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Kim and Tim Hill. Kim and Tim Heald, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you guys doing today? Great. Doing Thank great. you for having us. Thank you. Oh, the pleasure's mine. You know, uh, this is a fun topic because I think it's something that a lot of people in our field are contemplating right now, and that's the topic of uh, creating your own clinic. You know, one of the reasons I started this show is because, you know, so many of us as behavior analysts spend so much time on our cars driving all around the place to schools to uh, homes and so forth. And so the idea of, of uh, clients coming to us <laughs> and uh, you know, kind of managing, managing that whole travel process and to have all the materials and things like that seems like you know, a real alluring prospect. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on with it. So I'm really psyched that you guys are able to join me today to kind of give us a deep dive and to at least share your experience of what it was like to uh, start your clinic. So, uh, But before we get going here, um, you know, I want to talk about how you guys got into the field and... Uh, so, Kim, why don't you start us off with your journey in uh, behavior analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So, about 17 years ago, I was working on my undergrad degree and really contemplating if I was making the right decision within the degree that I had chosen at the time, which uh, was clinical and counseling psychology and a degree in chemical dependency. And uh, while I was working on that degree, one of my professors said, I've got this great guy, John Moran. He is working on this this thing called ABA. I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell you it's up and coming and you should go hear about it. And I decided to go check it out. And for anyone who has met or engaged with or listened to John, he's just incredibly easy to talk to. He's inspirational. He just really can spark anyone to be passionate about what he's passionate about, which was ABA and autism. And he started putting together a program where he was training college students to go out and help families who didn't have the funds and resources to get the services that they needed. And I started training under him and absolutely 100% fell in love. And that's where it started. And then I just kept moving from there, uh, working in New Hampshire, Mass., um, and working up to towards my BCBA, which was you know a very new credential. Nobody really knew what it was and why it was there and what we were supposed to do with it. Uh, but that's how I started in the field, and I just grew incredibly passionate about it. And I in New Hampshire didn't have a lot of us wandering around working in that field, so it was a great time for me to get into it and learn about it and and try to then do what John did for me, which was get some other people passionate about it. Very cool. Yes, I, I uh, remember those times. There was not many uh, BCBAs here in New Hampshire. I think when I moved yeah. here in 2004, there was probably less than a dozen of yeah. us. So it uh, and certainly we've, we've we've grown from there. Um, so Tim, how did you how did you get dragged into all of this? I can blame John too. Uh, he's he's very passionate and infectious with his way he communicates about behavior analysis, and I think uh, that's been a a blessing for for him and the people he's influenced, and as well as the company that we uh, have coming out of it. Uh, I went to school for business. Uh, I have a background in an MBA with a concentration in finance. So um, to to think that that turns into helping kids with autism is is uh, somewhat of a squirrely story, but. What it comes down to, uh, everything that I knew about OBM, and we talk about that from the cognitive behavioral side, which, you know, listen to the last episode or a few episodes ago, we had Aubrey Daniels on talking about MBA programs across the country still use cognitive psychology for all of their OBM curriculum. Now, that's a, a sweeping statement, and I, I hope to, to help change that, and I hope there's, there's others that are reaching out and, and helping to influence that. But uh, to see... You know, to read Walden too, and to read some of these original works, uh, and realize that this is something that just works. You know, the first two chapters in uh, the White Book is is phenomenal in Cooper that talk about the science and the 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 attitudes of science, and then the principles of behavior are just so brilliantly written and clear. <laughs> yeah, 
Agreed. Uh, and so um, I, I think you minimized uh, your your your. your um, I think both of you guys were very humble in that you could probably have gone on a little bit more about your background. And so I'm going to try to pull some of that out a little bit. But you have a different background in terms of entrepreneurship and things like that, right? Can you talk to a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so I, I went to school again for business um, and came out to work in investments. Went back to school again for, for business and focus and finance just because that was the industry I got started in. Uh, and it's fascinating and interesting as well. Uh, so I would encourage anybody who thinks they can influence people in finance, go ahead. I encourage you to. They, they need help. <laughs> uh, but then I, I absolutely got back into entrepreneurship. I grew up in a, a carpenter's home and we knew small business from, you know, started at 5 a.m. when the calls started coming in and ended when the customers were happy at the end of the day. So it was something I always knew when my father told me that uh, I would never be happy until I own my own business. And that's something that's really stuck with me all the all the way. And uh, and, and here I am today, lucky enough to, to, to do that with, with somebody that's, that's pretty fun to do that with. <laughs> uh, entrepreneurship, though, was, was always a passion. And when I started teaching at uh, a local university, you know, I glommed onto the students. And I love seeing people passionate. And I love seeing them being able to access those passions. So uh, did, that's what jazzes me up. Cool. Now, Kim, you um, you had worked for the May Institute, right? Yes. Yeah, can I did you... work for the May Institute, yeah. So why don't you guys kind of talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the evolution of where you started from and kind of where you ended up today in terms of starting, you know, Constellations. And, and especially, you know, if you want to put kind of like a, a New Hampshire twist on it, in other words, describe kind of, you know, we kind of alluded to this what the scene was like. You know, I'm using air quotes here on a podcast, but back in the day. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the business is, or the, the practice, if you will, of behavior analysis has kind of grown up around us, right? So can you kind of paint a picture of, of, of kind of where you were as a practitioner early on and how you guys came to the conclusion of starting, uh, you know, not just a, you know, a, a, a consultation service, but also, a, you know, uh, again, a, an agency and then subsequently the clinic? Absolutely. I think, so for me, New Hampshire really wasn't recognizing BCBAs or ABA services when I was coming into the field. So there were a few people, you know, providing that level of support here and there across the state, often in public schools, uh, but not a lot. And so when I was coming into the field, it really made a lot of sense for me to drive down to Massachusetts, where there was a little bit more awareness um, and there were more options. So I went down there to get some experience under my belt. And that was off John's recommendation as well. He said, you know, you've, you're going to have a lot more opportunity to get different jobs, different experience, diversify, get that experience under your belt, and then consider whether you want to go back to school, which I advise you to do. And so I went down there and started working and um, decided to go back to school. The decision to come back into New Hampshire, I think, was partly because I wanted to come back and work with John. Um, my passion was certainly, it sprouted from my relationship with him and his passion in the field. And he gave me this really golden opportunity to come back and start working under him and, and learning more about the science and really doing what I knew in my heart felt great. So I had the opportunity to come back in there. And then at the same time, I felt like I had this opportunity to help bring a little bit more of the ABA principles and methodologies into New Hampshire where it really wasn't existing that much. Um, at the time I was still working privately. John was basically my advisor and John had his own practice. I had my own practice. And what Tim, I think saw happening around us was that there was this great opportunity for this great science to make a little bit more of a splash in the state and I would have people calling and looking for a mentor and I would mentor them. And some of them were very like-minded to John and myself. And Tim kept saying, is there a reason why the two of you aren't doing this together and making this bigger and helping more children, more schools, more families? And Tim is that entrepreneur-minded person, uh, had a lot of ideas as to how we could help more people. and. That was hard for John and I, who, you know, it was just easy for us to not worry about any business aspect, but really just kick off our shoes, get on the floor with the kids, get on the floor with the staff, show them that we were willing to work through everything with them, 
um, that was where a lot of our passion was was coming from. So the business end of it, the passion was really coming more so from Tim. And John ended up saying, you know, I'm, I, I should retire here at some point. I'd love to leave something. Maybe Tim's right. We should, we can be doing more. Let's, let's keep talking. And that's when we, we merged our practices and formed constellations. And at the time we were really just bringing people in who thought like us, um, the people who love to, again, kind of kick off their shoes, get on the floor with the kids and really get into the nitty gritty of learning who these kids were and helping the staff identify that they could be passionate about this science without scaring them away about all, you know, all the words and terminology. Uh, so that's, that's really how it started, uh, through a, a little fire that I think Tim lit. And so can you guys describe kind of where you are now in terms of like where you operate, the number of practitioners you have working for you and, and things like that? Sure. We're, uh, <clears throat> come, come quite a ways. And I think the attitude has changed from we, can we, should we, to we can, we have a responsibility to, uh, cause I do think we, you know, Constellations and a lot, few of the other great companies in the area uh, and around the country really have a real commitment to the field and are realizing that, you know, we're, we are training the next level of uh, the next generation of practitioners for behavior analysis. And fortunately for us, it gets to be the biggest one to date in, in human history. So, um, you know, on the TRICARE call a few years ago, I remember sitting down and, and somebody's complaining about the fact that nurse practitioners or other medical providers already exist and there are programs out there for them, but we have to pay to train our new, new uh, generation of, of RBTs and BCBAs. And I, I heard a lot of strain in her voice on that call, but I think now it's recognized as really a privilege because guess how much influence that has and the impact that what your training systems may have, not only for providers and practitioners, but for clients and children that will have, you know, lives impacted for a very long time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really fun and uh, exciting work. Very cool. So, um, so let's kind of get closer to the topic, I guess, and, uh, and that list. So, um, in terms of starting a clinic and things like that. So you guys made a decision to start a clinic, uh, some, some, uh, time ago, uh, obviously, um, what were the circumstances that led you to make this move? Were there signals in the marketplace or, you know, did it, you know, just kind of talk about how you arrived at that decision to, to go forward with that endeavor? Cause it's obviously is quite an endeavor of, getting the space and all that stuff. And... I, w I would say blind ambition really, really <laughs> sums it up. No, we, you know, looking back, trying to put reason to the decision at the time that we made it, uh, is really tough. And I think that's, that's true for a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, you, if you have a, a equation or a business plan that says, absolutely, this makes sense. There's no risk involved. Somebody did that 70 years ago. And the opportunity to to either develop a, an enterprise for going concern or to help clients is is limited. Um, so you have to make decisions that don't always make sense at face value. Now you have to pair that obviously with some some level of risk mitigation and and sense of uh, reality. So I'm not saying jump off a cliff and just hope that you land. Uh, Kim always loves using the quote oh, that. I love that quote. You want to do that one? <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, oh, what is it? Uh, an entrepreneur is someone who jumps out of an airplane, builds the parachute on the way down. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, build, build, say, building the plane while yeah. you're flying. It is a, is a term I like to use. Yeah. <laughs> so in hindsight, it, you know, it, it, it looked a lot like that at the time. I, everything seemed to make sense. You know, we were very confident we we had a schedule worked out and then we got to about six, six, eight months in and realized that third party payers don't recognize you as a uh, equal professional and, and are really happy to, to reimburse. Uh, it's a different process. So that was a learning curve. And then about 12 months in, we were able to help influence the, the laws, the mandate that we had in the state with a, a team of people. And uh, it, that changed everything, right? Because we had a program that could see kids 10 hours a week. And with the financial limits, we could now do medical necessity. And uh, we, we can get back up to where Programs are justified as, as you know, prescribed by the BACB. So it, that changed the schedule. It changed the dynamic we had with parents. Uh, created a, a group of parents that came in early on and, and were used to us and had expectations and, and you know didn't want to deal with change. And then we had a new group of parents that were very comfortable with the new program. So I would say 
the biggest the biggest challenge for opening a center would be to make sure that your funding sources are in place you know what the requirements are what the regulations are so your risk is mitigated mm -hmm. and then also the communication you have with your parents uh, so that your your expectations are in line with theirs and everybody seems to have a better day when expectations are in line so one of the fun things I think that's great about having you guys on here is that you guys have already gone through the process. I have to imagine there were some, you know, kind of challenges or things that you couldn't anticipate that came up. And uh, so I'm wondering if you're able to share those so others don't have to kind of walk those same steps. You know, we did, you know, get, we're going to get into some listener questions that, uh, it, it, in a, in a specifically in a minute, but uh, you know this is a very, this is a specific question that I had for you, and it was also echoed by our listener uh, Ryan. You know, so if there are any unforeseen speed bumps or roadblocks you ran into, you know, how you know how did you guys manage them? Um, or first of all, what were they, and then how did you guys overcome them? And what subsequently is the uh, the lesson to be learned from that for others contemplating such a move? I think some of the initial roadblocks we had are things that probably new practitioners starting new businesses may not experience because insurance now has been in place for a little while. Um, you know, we may see some changes as, as codes change and rates change and all that. But um, I think some of just from a logistics standpoint, probably the single handed biggest challenge and obstacle that we experienced was um, scheduling. So we come from a world of individualization. And we say that we, you know, as a BCBA, we don't want anything cookie cutter. We want everything individualized. Um, we pride ourselves on the fact that we analyze each individual student. And there's, you know, so much of our initial research and, and the push throughout your programs is about single subject research. So um, when we had a bunch of families who had a bunch of different dynamics and other children and other therapies and had to get to work at a certain time, just everything under the sun. We really, really, really tried at the beginning of opening the clinic and getting into insurance funding to be as individualized as possible and really work with every single family to come up with a schedule that would work for them as well as the child and the clinical recommendations that we were putting forth. That quickly became incredibly hard to manage because the reality is you have to have the staff working and productive and you do have to also abide by your clinical recommendations. And if you have a whole bunch of families with a whole bunch of different schedules, it, it's it really, it's not feasible. Um, and that I think was difficult for me uh, because I came from a place working with John and my experiences working with families in schools and families in their homes I really, truly wanted to accommodate them. Uh, so being able to sit there with a family and say, this is where we can individualize and this is where we may have to offer certain blocks of time because that's what we can feasibly do when we're managing a bunch of direct care staff who, who need to be productive so that we can keep doing what we're doing. And I think learning some of those lessons and having to shift were, were probably some of the toughest things. And we did a lot of research. Um, Tim, myself, uh, Jen, our, our director in the clinic, uh, we bounced around the nation, saw different clinics. We reached out to different experts in our field. We talked to a lot of people, um, all of which were wonderful, just giving us advice that, again, they had, they had been through. And what we were finding more and more was that people experienced those same struggles and really ended up having to make some of those hard decisions. Um, so I think the schedule was probably from my perspective, one of the hardest things, um, certainly collections and insurance uh, were, were obstacles um, initially getting into the field. But I would say that that was, that was probably the biggest one. The other thing that um, we still kind of joke about today is there wasn't a day that went by that we didn't realize, we realized we would have to have a, a protocol or a system or some kind of rule and procedure <laughs> in place. Um, you know, everything from a billing system down to do we remove ticks from children if they get one and they come into the clinic? You know, just the amount of things that we realized we had to have systems in place for, it, I mean, it became laughable at certain points. Uh, so I'm writing a procedure for this. Uh, <laughs> that was, those were kind of tough lessons. And, you know, again, you, you know, you fast forward the clock a little bit. And at this point, we feel like we've, we've got most of our systems in place. We're feeling pretty good. But there's always that odd circumstance that pops up and everyone's looking at you. Uh, so you have to have the answer. I see. Um, 
what are their kind of nitty gritty that you know? I mean, obviously, you know, the tick is is I think is is, par- is probably as granular granular as you can get with this sort of thing. But uh, whether uh, I'm just curious, like, what are some other kind of I don't want to say silly, but you know, because obviously, you know, attending to hygiene is 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 is, is serious business. But you know, what are some things you had you hadn't thought about? You know, like, I'm, and I'm just thinking like things of like like looking for the physical space. You know, uh, oh, and and you know, you know, after you moved in, it's like, oh, I wish we had X, you know, or I wish the bathroom was set up like Y, or I wish the parking lot was like this, you know, from a just, you know, you know, um, did you have to have the fire marshal come through and you know, you know, uh, bless the uh, the, uh, the 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 sprinkler system or whatever, you know? Can you just talk about some of the the, the more nuts and bolts part, you know? You, you hit on a this... lot of them right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just said them all. That's okay. <laughs> uh, certainly not all of them, but yes, those are so all. So I'm factors. ready to open a clinic, is what you're saying? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's it's a thing, and and I think what anybody who's out there thinking about doing this, uh, they shouldn't expect that they should be able to do it all on their own. And by that, I don't mean that you can't start your own business and, and set out there individually, because uh, a partnership's a, a totally different beast. But don't don't be that hard on yourself to think that I need to be an expert at everything. So there, there's help out there. There's assistance that can be gotten pretty, pretty cheaply. We have a great university down the road, university of New Hampshire that has uh, 13,000 ish students that are all looking for part-time work and they're all studying exactly what I need help with right now, whether it's marketing or some, you know, even some legal advice, but I, I wouldn't necessarily go to a student for that, but you can connect with a professor to get, get some thoughts. Um, Elance or other websites like that are great ways to, to get help so that you don't have to teach yourself Adobe Creative Suite and buy it yourself and to get your first ad out, uh, your first marketing flyer. Um, so I would, I would say get the assistance that's available to you because that allows you to leverage your time uh, to be a lot more effective, not only for your business, but for your clients as well. I think some advice that was given to me a long time ago, and it really resonated, and it's something I've said to every single person who works in our company, um, particularly our directors and our leadership team, because we do a lot of leadership training, is hire the person smarter than you. And that's okay. I, you know, I think when you start a business, you want to be seen as the ex- expert entrepreneur who is able to do it all. And I think there, there's a certain satisfaction in feeling like maybe you can do it all. But the reality is there's someone out there who has something else that you maybe didn't know about or did, can't do as well. And they bring something to the table that just rounds everything out and makes everything feel that much better. Uh, so always look always look for that help. And I think, as you know, I mean, social media is all over the place. There's so many uh, ABA business builder groups on Facebook, APBA put stuff out all the time. So I think knowing how to connect with all of those, those players, um, so that you can learn from the mistakes that we probably all made at some point. Sure. It's Speaking usually of, helpful. Well, you, you, that was a perfect segue by the way, because, uh, 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 one of one of the, one of my listeners, Shasta, writes in. She wants to know if there's any mistakes that uh, that you've learned from, and anything that you'd do differently knowing now what you, uh, you know. I would recommend learning from every mistake, and I'd like to the, claim that I think I've made every one of them. The, 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 one, okay, let me ask the question: Does one mistake stand out? Ah, oh, I wish we did X instead of Y. I think we would have hired in some strong help right from the beginning, right at the beginning, you're, you're doing so much to manage cost because you're, you're starting, you're, you have a center, you have a building, you have all this overhead and you that can be scary. That can be really scary, but there's a point where you need to invest in the great people who can help you get to the next level or the great resources, the people who can push things forward. And you might be paying a little bit more from them. And this is research that's been done in our field before. Um, Dennis Reed, there's a, a ton that he puts out there. Get those good people in there uh, because they're the ones that are going to help you push to the next level and it'll feel better um, than trying to eek by cutting all the costs and maybe bringing in resources that aren't going to help you move forward with as much fluency as you really could have. So what's an example of the type of resource you would have brought on sooner rather than later? I would say office help, admin help, uh, marketing assistance, good accounting advice, 
uh, solid HR advice for compliance for DOL, um, Department of Labor. You know, you just want to make sure that all of your risks are mitigated ahead of time because as you grow, they just multiply. Uh, and, and no business owner, and, and hopefully no business owner, opens a business and tries to think like, oh, I'm going to screw my employees this way or that way. But you'd be surprised the the funky laws that are out there in the states that you know that we have around the country. Uh, and they're all different. They're all slightly flavored differently so that if you're in, you know, in the Northeast of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, you have four different sets of labor laws that might have different nuances. So I would say get get that advice ahead of time. And if you can do as much planning as possible prior to opening, as much planning as marketing as possible uh, so that the day you open, your systems are set so you can focus on running the business rather than building it at the same time. I see. All right. Good advice. Um, so let's talk about kind of day-to-day operations. How many people uh, do you have staffing the clinic right now? Uh, so all our whole clinic is uh, one-on-one. So the clinic itself is an early intervention clinic. We run um, an early intensive educational program. So we have technicians with all of our staff. We also have peer coaches who um, have helped helped the BCBAs um, get things going quicker, um, help when we bring in new staff. And as Tim alluded to, and we've, we've said, and I know, Matt, you've experienced being in the state as well, we're growing a field. So we don't have the luxury of having a lot of resumes coming through with a tremendous amount of experience anymore. We, you know, we used to. Um, but the so we have all of our RBTs. We've got peer coaches. And then we have um, supervising BCBAs and a program director who oversees oversees the building. I see, and um, I think you alluded to this earlier in terms of you know the kind of efficiency of the clinic and providing parents with some sort of structure about when and when you can't provide services. But um, do you have any advice for for people trying to stay kind of productive throughout the day? I've heard with some clinics there's like this dead time in the middle of the day where kids are in school. Uh, but there's a lot of a lot of activity either early in the morning or in the afternoons and things like that. Um, how how right. do you, a I guess do you guys see those patterns in 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 your clinic, and and b how do you manage those in order to stay kind of efficient and productive uh, while providing these services? So um, we don't have a lot of dead time, and the primary reason we don't is because this is an intensive program. So the kids are here all day. Uh, and that's a commitment that one would be based on assessment. There are some kids that we would say don't qualify for that. Um, but the kids who do are here all day. And, um, certainly we have kids who might end up out sick or on vacation with their family and they're not here and the staff might have some gaps, but the staff work off rotation. So they would probably have at least two other kids anyway. Um, but the way we view it is we've always said to our families, to our school districts, to everyone we work with, the clinic certainly is an early intensive program with the purpose of helping kids get ready for school and all the skills that they may need to keep moving forward in life. But the other thing that the clinic is, is a training ground. And if you don't have a student for the day, there are a million things that you could still be learning. Uh, No one is perfect. No one has all the answers. No one knows everything. Um, Most of our staff out there have not worked across, uh, tons of children. Some of them are brand new to our field. So we have a a level system with all of our technicians and we would expect that if you're not doing something, there's certainly probably some materials or something you could be doing. Um, but we would rather if you were overlapping, learning new students, generalizing your skills, learning new concepts, we do try to diversify everyone's caseload. So if you have, uh, you know, a nonverbal student on your caseload, you'll probably have a higher functioning student who's working on social skills as well. So that you can generalize your skills right from the beginning. But as, as you know, and a lot of our listeners know, when you teach a lot of these skills to staff, they learn it really well with the student they're with. And then you put them with somebody else. And all of a sudden you think to yourself, how come you didn't generalize everything I just taught you with ABA? So there are always, always, always opportunities for training. And we do a ton of overlap and and we do that at the clinic, but we do that across our branches as well. Uh, So that's how we're filling most of the time. I see. Let's talk about uh, some other management 
uh, issues. So um, how do you guys use uh, behavioral strategies to optimize staff performance? And this was a question asked by uh, a listener, uh, Adam. Uh, and we we can take this in any direction you want to go with you know whether it's you know staff trainer onboarding competency based instruction uh, you know providing corrective feedback incentive based pay and things like that um, talk a little bit about some of your OBM practices if you could so we've we've really bought into the fact that this science works with kids with autism but it is obviously the behavior of organisms not just kids with autism <clears throat> so we apply the science not only to our kids but to our employees to ourselves uh, and those practices are, are across the board from when you first see a recruiting ad that we might put out um, every core principle we have all of the behavioral you know guidelines that, that drive what it is to be a member of, of constellations to be, to be part of the team uh, is ingrained throughout the in process for employment. So from interview to re recruiting to interview to uh, review and promotion and career progression, uh, we, we are try to align those efforts across the board. Uh, we have treated this as an experiment all along the way. Uh, one of the great books that I love is The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. He uh, treats business just like an experiment. Uh, call it a social experiment if you want. But essentially, if, if you've got a program that works, go for it. And if it doesn't, change it quick and try something different. Uh, so we, we did try the performance management um, that Abernathy wrote about. Mm -hmm. uh, pay for profit, sorry, not performance management, pay for profit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I could have done that, implemented that more poorly. If, if I was really <laughs> interested in, in trying to do a... a true pay for profit system, I would seek advice next time. Absolutely seek advice from somebody who knows how to do it better than this. Uh, it turned out we, we didn't do it very well. Um, that said, we have found that, you know, a, a, applying to or prescribing to all the laws that are in place for salaries or, or pay by hour uh, and exemption rules and things like that. But above and beyond that, having intermittent bonuses throughout the year that provide for an opportunity for somebody who's working really, really hard or has overcome a challenge that they've been working on uh, and has been putting a lot of effort into getting that done. To be able to reinforce them for that is is paramount to, to what we do. And I know we've got a lot more systems that Kim will tell you about now. Uh, we do run a competency-based program. So I've everyone in the company has heard from me. Uh, letters at the end of your name are, are pretty and, and good. It's great that they're there. Um, but when push comes to shove, it's about the competency and application, uh, cause we've got students that we're worried about and we have a responsibility towards. So the application and the generalization of that application becomes huge for, um, your own skill sets in your own career progression, uh, but also obviously the, the students and their outcomes as well. So we do run a competency based, uh, company in general. Uh, we have competencies from our technicians, uh, all the way up through our leadership team. Um, we have a data driven mindset across the company. We want everybody to know again, if this is a practice, what you preach, if I'm going to tell you these things work great with kids, I should be able to also show you and have you experience why it's working well with you. We also seek feedback from our staff on a very regular basis. So uh, we do regular staff surveys. We meet with people randomly and individually um, in order to seek feedback. We have um, committees of people who come together so that across levels, people can share in the problem solving. Because if, if they feel as though something isn't working well, why not get the solution directly from them and have them go sell it back to their peers rather than me saying it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to do a lot to um, boost morale, boost competency across the company. But all of those things would be tied to um, the potential for promotion, the potential for financial increase, the potential for bonuses. Uh, a lot of it works on intermittent schedules. Uh, and a lot of that feedback, as Tim said, we've, we've tested a lot of systems. And our own team was telling us they didn't love the model that we had attempted to set up off uh, pay for profit. And I, I, like Tim said, we would have, if we were going to circle back to that, we would have sought advice because um, I think we weren't um, using it in our particular 
company as, as it maybe would have been intended. But we have come up with some really great systems that have worked really well. And I think what's important to know, though, is just like everyone we work with, reinforcement changes and we need to be on top of it and we need to be listening to what the employees are saying. Um, so some things become more or less important depending on what else is going on in someone's life or um, politically or whatever else might be happening. So we're constantly doing reinforcer assessments with our own team and then using that information to, to make changes and create different offers for people. Very cool. Yeah, it's not an employment contract. It's an employment relationship. So as, as the person evolves and develops, you have to pay attention and, and keep that line of communication open. And as soon as someone feels like they, they can't voice their opinion or, or get heard, then you know, the relationship starts going down pretty pretty quickly. I see. So um, where are you guys kind of growth-wise, you know, is, is it, and, and what are, you know, because um, it sounds like this has obviously been a, a significant endeavor, because I know you, you don't just do the clinic, you're out and about, and I, you know, kind of see you guys out there from time to time in, in, in schools and, and, and other settings and things like that. Um can you talk about kind of where you've come to as as an organization and kind of where you think things are going? We've uh, we've been done doing a lot of reading lately uh, outside of the field. So we, uh, we've got a leadership team that's a few years old now. Uh, when I say a few years old, I'm, I'm referring to the the efforts that we put in place to to start introducing them to concepts that would allow us to apply the science to adults and each other. And sometimes that reading comes from outside of behavior analysis. And I've found that that has been very advantageous. You know, when somebody is, is skilled and adept at <clears throat> being a BCBA, now we can go out and use that lens to evaluate the work of others. And there, there's a lot of work of others outside of our field that has value. Um, not that it would hold up to a, a peer reviewed journal inside the field, but it would give us ideas on how to do things differently. And, and I would say, just look at science looking at uh, biology to find new ways to get uh, stickiness factors to work when they look at chameleons, et cetera. Uh, and that, is, that has helped a lot. Uh, the ideas that come out of that are significant and they're not from us, they're from the team themselves. So we, being in an ABA field, you know, we, we can say that we have a lot of disadvantages and everybody's against us, but uh, I do, truly believe that we have a huge advantage in that you employ more BCBAs than anybody else, right? So if you want to have a consultant work with your team on how to better change the behavior of your team or be, become more effective or more efficient with certain things, you have the experts right there available to you. You just have to turn around and ask them to work on a project. Uh, so that's that's a fun advantage for sure. Nice, nice. All right, cool. So let's get to some, uh, some more listener questions. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, Elizabeth asks, uh, I recently opened my own practice in Germany, and I would like some advice on preventing staff burnout and lowering turnover rates when finances are tight. What do you, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think we're all asking ourselves what we can do about staff burnout, the work they put uh, into these kids, and sometimes kids who can be pretty aggressive and hard, it, it, it's, it can be a really long day. And they, they put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into their therapy. Um, I think when I consider staff burnout and how to keep people motivated, um, like I had said, we, you have to listen to them. You have to empower them. You have to let them know that they're, they're a part of this company and, and very much, the, the backbone in a lot of ways. So they need to feel heard. They need to feel like they can um, tell us what's working and what's not working. You need to be sure you can reinforce them. And I think when finances are tight, when we survey our staff, it's actually really surprising how many people don't mention money. They mention attention. Um, they want to hear from their supervisors and very specifically, sometimes they actually just want to hear from the owners. Uh, when we uh, put out surveys, we'll sometimes say, do you feel as though the, the you know, schedule of attention and the amount of time you get with your supervisor is appropriate? Why or why not? And is attention from a particular person more or less valuable to you? And we're, we're kind of always shocked when people will say, we love to hear from Kim and Tim. And I think just being able to, as an owner, Put aside the fact that you've got all those logistics and, and the billing and the 
the bazillion procedures that you need to put together and get out there and see your team and reinforce them and smile and point out all the wonderful things that they're doing. And that goes a really long way. And we found that that works in schools too. You know, in our public school branch, we often hear from consultants, I don't have control over the reinforcement schedules and I wish I could give the pairs more money. And those are the things we don't have control over, but we do have control over sending the email to the SPED director to say how amazing somebody's been and how hard they've worked and how much we've appreciated working with their team. And that those simple little emails and those simple attention seeking things that people just need to hear are it, that, those things go, I would say further sometimes than, than the money. Um, which is expected and nice, sure. But when money's tight, there's a lot of different ways that you can reinforce your team. So I've listened to them. And the other thing that I think has been a huge, huge, huge focus for certainly us, um, the bigger you get, the more you realize that everyone needs to believe what you believe. So culture bleeding is incredibly important. And just because I started in this field and I'm incredibly passionate about it, the further I get away from any of the staff that we hire in, the more I rely on everybody else in our company to say what I would say, believe what I would believe and and bleed that passion. And I think if you can identify how to bleed culture, you will find that people want to stay with you. And if they don't want to stay with you, they probably don't share the same culture and you're probably going to be better off without them, even though there might be some immediate pain. I see. Um, That's a, the, the bleeding culture, that's a term I'm unfamiliar with. Is there a specific uh, a book or resource or something like that 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 comes from? And um, if if you don't have the answer off the top of your head, it's something we can certainly put in the, the show notes. I just, uh, it's an interesting term that I'm unfamiliar with. There's a lot of content on culture and, and uh, how to spread culture in a way that is not, you know, uh, behavior mod, but more <laughs> behavior analysis, right? So people want to, to buy into a mission, a, a passion, and a vision. Uh, so I, I would just Google that and, okay. and reach out. Uh, there are lots of different ways to try to solve it. And, you know, I hope that we get to be part of the, the behavior analy- um, analysis of what that should actually look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now you see, you know, stories, slogans, share the message, decide together on what the culture should be. So when we, say we, we want them to, to repeat what we repeat and, and act like the way we would act in front of a client. That was decided by a team of people. That wasn't just, you know, Tim and Kim. That was a, a fantastic team that came together and put a lot of time and effort and, and excitement. They've been with us for quite some time to try to define who, who we are and, and what we are. And now we're spending a lot of efforts into spreading that message as much as we can throughout the company so that uh, that just is a self-perpetuating essence of of what it means to be a team member all right cool okay folks pardon the interruption here but i do want to let you know that behavioralobservations.com is an ace provider so if you are in need of any type 2 continuing education head on over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get ce's and check out our offerings there we have stuff on ethics supervision functional assessment and acceptance and commitment therapy. So again, check it out at behavioralobservations.com forward slash get C's. Annie writes in um, saying, I am the sole owner of my company, Behavior Trend, which offers ABA services in a variety of settings. Uh, Right now, I'm wearing many hats in the company from marketing to clinical supervision. If you could rank the, the top three areas that a small and fairly new ABA clinic should focus on to grow, what would they be? Great question, Eddie. And I, I know I would have asked the same thing. So I, <laughs> you're very, very astute. Uh, first off, just seek help, right? When you can identify that you don't know enough, go go get help. But for the, the three specifically, and, and I see this as, you know, as part of the mission of the company, as well as, you know, how to protect the going concern, you know, you want to make sure clinical integrity is tight. That That's number one. If you're not as, as confident or as happy with the, the training that you've put in place or the de- delivery of services that are happening or the effects of those services, that's where you should be spending your time. And if, if it all falls apart because you focus too much on clinical integrity, I, I hope you can sleep well at night that that, that was okay. 
The second one would be risk management, and that that comes down to all of those, you know, the rules and regs and laws and of your state, uh, DOE, DOL, DOI. Those are three departments that you should get familiar with uh, at your state level. And re- click on their websites and and look at the top ten reasons for violations. That's a real easy way to stay out of hot water. Um, they they do try to provide resources. Uh, I can't say all the states are equal, but I would definitely reach out and feel free to make a phone call. They're there to help you. Um, you know, when they show up to audit you, it's a different story, but at the onset they they should be there to help you. And then number three would be your team. If you can get a passionate team of people to believe in a similar mission, uh, you know, the need for procedures and protocols, and I know we talked about that a little too much probably, but, uh, that diminishes, you know, obviously you need to let everybody know exactly how to, to take a tick off for safety reasons, but you don't need to worry about hey, should we attend that event to see if we want to spread the word and, and try to expand services because the team's on board and is already there for you. Cool. Um, Celia writes in, uh, she says, what are your thoughts on hiring individuals with RBT credentials to implement direct implementation or at a minimum individuals in the process of are, are, uh, obtaining it? So as I said before, uh, we are a training business and we're in we're in a field where we need to be training so um we hire more for culture personality passion uh, than we do skills it's it's now easy for us to break down this the application skills needed for somebody to become credentialed um and i think this does vary from state to state as well but we um we're looking for people who fit in the company so that we can get people again, just as passionate, um, just as motivated. And then we can fill in those skills later. So we do spend a lot of time on the credentialing side. I see. And she also writes in asking basically uh, how many resources in in terms of staffing are dedicated to administrative tasks with insurance and HR and all this, uh, you know, kind of fun, fun stuff we've been talking about. So that's going to depend. And that comes down to the experiment, unfortunately. Uh, it, it is really variable. We have multiple payer sources, so we get to experience you know, the, the pros and cons of each. Uh, when you have a, another business that's contracted your services, you send an invoice, you get paid. That doesn't take a lot of people to follow up on that. But when you've got institutions that you know, aren't necessarily as easy to work with or require much more detail or more record, you need more resources around it. And I wish there was a really easy formula to provide uh, what I would say is if something doesn't feel right, take the time to fix it. And that may mean adding a person. It may mean allowing a person to go find a more successful job. Uh, something we always want to do is try to nurture and develop people. And, and sometimes folks just are in a bad position. So if, if somebody's not working out in a position and you're enabling that, you're costing your clients and your other employees uh, and that person themselves because they, they could be much happier in a, in a different position. So if something's not working, make sure you fix it, either by supporting and adding resources or, or maybe shifting some people around in their seats. I see. All right, cool. All right, so um, uh, to all the listeners just sent in questions, thanks for taking the time to do so. I, I want to get back to some, uh, some other questions that I have. So, um, so I'm going to ask something personal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh what's it like to uh to be the husband and wife team uh you know how does that work um how do you guys manage roles and and things like that i have to imagine because you know I, I my wife's not a behavior analyst and so and we don't you know work in the in the at the same you know place and so on and so forth and uh, I can imagine that would open up a can of worms. Uh, were, were that the case? Were that not the case? So, um, are you guys comfortable with sharing how you guys manage this this dynamic? Sure. I mean, there's really only one rule. It's it's marry the right person. <laughs> okay. Uh, good an- Good answer. <laughs> All right, Kim. Tell no, us, comes Kim, time to open Kim, Kim, tell us the real uh, the real answer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. O- open communication, uh, managing egos letting the other person walk away when they need to. And, uh, it's still not easy. You know, the highest of highs are are better and the lowest of lows aren't necessarily as much fun Mm -hmm. when times aren't great. And you, you have a tough day at work and you go home and and need support from somebody that's also having a tough day at work. The correlation is pretty high, but, uh, no, it comes down to just marry the right person. I would say. Okay. All right, cool. 
Uh, last question here. Um, and I know you guys, you know, you guys have, you probably have this, uh, question answered uh you know quite a bit since through your hiring process and things like that but what advice do you have for a, a newly minted bcba who's taking their first job so let's say you know you hire someone comes right out of their program and they go to constellations behavioral services.com they they uh, hit you know inquire about employment and you they go through you know i'm, I'm kidding of course but anyway so t- talk to us <laughs> about what <laughs> Talk to us about, you know, what, what, you know, what, what advice do you have for, for new practitioners in the field that are getting their feet wet? And I'll stop joking around and let you answer. <laughs> so I, I think the best advice is to look at your, your whole career as a journey. Uh, you don't have to fast forward through it. Uh, the experience that you get in your early years allows you to build that foundation of skills that you're going to need to keep moving forward. And again, this is a, this is a science. Every time we turn around, there's a new journal article out there, right? So, um, there's just so much to learn and there are so many people who have probably come before you, who have come before you, who, um, know a lot and there's a lot of people to learn from. So take the time to learn. Um, I think, you know, as we do a lot of our training for when we do our supervisor training, um, we spend a lot of time talking to our new BCBAs about the fact that, you know, just because you want to get into consultation, when you're sitting there in front of the technician, you need to be the expert. And if they ask you to show them and you get in and you're not feeling great and you're not so fluent with your own therapy, that's not going to work. You know, so you want to be fluent. You want to be comfortable. You want to admit when you don't know. I, I, I think I've said so many times learn how to confidently say, I don't know, uh, because when you do that, you'll also gain respect. And then as a BCBA, I know you're going to turn around and you're going to go find an answer, whether that's going to the journals or going to a colleague, going to your team. Um, but seek out that clinical support and just take the time to get the experience because it's going to allow you to be a better consultant. If you move in that direction, a better practitioner, better clinician, better supervisor. Great, great advice. So, uh, I guess I'll close with this. Do you, it, you know, if you guys have any final thoughts, uh, feel free to add them. Also, let, let uh, listeners know where they can learn more about you guys. Well, I, I think you gave them the website already. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Right. Uh, constellationsbehavioral.com. We, uh, we're a Northeast company. We hope to connect with other business owners in the area and, and around the nation so that we can continue to develop even more effective services for our and service clients. Uh, I think if there's a you know a call to action for why we wanted to get on on this call, I would say it's it's shared with Pat Fryman and Dr. Hanley and the fact that we Ron, as, Leaf. Ron Leaf, yeah, he's, yeah, that was a great yeah. presentation. Uh, we as a field haven't done a great job of selling ourselves, and you know we can judge ourselves all we want, but moving forward, I think we need to do a much better job of dissemination and not just dissemination through peer-reviewed articles, but dissemination in ways that. The general public can absorb and appreciate and enjoy. Uh, we, we have to get into the, the entertainment business, unfortunately. So we, we pair our behavior analytic services with effective communication so that we can pursue Skinner's dream and, and help it become realized of making the world a better place. Very cool. All right. Kim and Tim Heald, thanks for joining me on today's episode of the Behavioral Op- <laughs> Let me try that again. The Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thanks a lot, thanks, Matt. Matt. Good work. All right. Thanks. Alrighty, folks, that's all the time we have. So head on over to behavioralobservations.com session 35 for show notes. I've got some of the links to some of the things we talked about today. And if you want to leave any comments, you can certainly uh, add those there. And until session 36, I'll see you later. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.